A maven, an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. The ultimate upset has happened. A 16 has beaten a 1. UMBC knocks off Virginia 74 to 54. The madness has hit its peak as a 16 defeats a 1 for the first time in NCAA history. I have to say I got text everybody did the whole country was watching. And so for that reason, we'll call today's show Retriever Talk, because this is, to me, the greatest upset in the history of college basketball. And I was going to talk O's with my Oriole buddy and good friend and mentor, Stan the Fan Charles. He's on the phone right now, but the O's take a deep second place to the Retrievers today, Stan. Well, remember, I'm, a, I'm an alum. Oh, that's, all of a sudden you're I, an alum. All that's, of a sudden. that's where I graduated from. I know UMBC. that. I know that. Yeah. Uh, absolutely remarkable. I put it up there with uh, Buster Douglas, Mike Tyson. Uh, it's that type. It's, it's larger than it's just. Bigger. Uh, it's and, bigger than that. It's bigger yeah, than that. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's hard to remember how invincible Mike uh, seemed. But, you know. That phrase that a, a 16 has never beaten a one, Bruce, is something we've said for, what, uh, 136 prior times. It's never happened. Uh, it really seemed like one of those things in sports that the matchup was so greatly weighed in front of the, in front of the number one that it would truly never happen. I didn't really think we'd see this. Stan, I tell you, last week on the show... I was happy, really happy for UMBC for making the dance. But the thing that made me the happiest was I knew that they could not match up Maryland with UMBC. Right? Because right. you could smell that coming. All right? right? They might even have made Maryland go to that new arena. All right? right. So, and it would, have been, it would have been a nightmare. This well, is, well, listen, this team... K.J. Mora and Jairus Lyles, I, you can't describe the kind of game that they had. You really yeah, can't say K.J. Mora created, look, Lyles had the, the huge game. There's no question about it. But when you talk about breaking another team down, uh, it, Mara is just a very, very, look, listen, they could very easily lose to K-State the next game uh, or a nine seed. But I'm telling you, he presents some unique problems for for a defense. But I'll tell you what keyed keyed their game. And I've seen them I've seen them play about four four or five times now this year, which is a little high for me, Bruce. Uh, I saw them play at Towson earlier in the year, and they they had a, a player injured. They they weren't playing with any defensive ferocity at all. But I saw them. Um, play in the new building against Vermont about three and a half weeks ago. I was there. And they played, they played, you were there. Right. They played a tough first half, but within about a five minute stretch in the second half, they suddenly were blown out by that team. I then saw them in the playoffs and they got off to a horrible start against UMass Lowell, uh, who was coached ironically by Jim Duquette's brother, Pat Duquette. Uh, and they, they were down, I think, 10 or 12 points early. I think it was 14 to 1 or something like that. And they came back and won that game based on defensive, you know, defensive intensity. And then I saw them play uh, the second game in the playoffs. Uh, they were just really defensively intense from the get-go. And last night, I thought their defense really keyed the game. Uh, they came to play Virginia, and, and listen, I think the world of Tony Bennett. I think he's a great coach, and I thought if you want to show a video of how, the, how to define class, I thought his interview with uh, 
uh, Ms. Wilson and Tracy Wilson last night was really something special because he took he took what sport is about and turned it into what it should be about more often is learning life lessons. Uh, but I think that Tony Bennett did not have his team prepared for what hit them last night, and he'll have to live with that. Yeah, the 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 loss of DeAndre Hunter. It yeah, would have been one yeah, more. It would have been yeah. one more possible cog to stop the run. He's a matchup you know, nightmare. I, I've totally forgotten about that, as a matter of fact. That is a huge loss. But yep. still, even without him, they should have been able to win the game. But DeAndre yeah. Hunter is a six seven guard. He's a matchup nightmare. You don't know what to do with him. He can take any guard inside. Uh, he averaged nine points a game. Maybe that spark off the bench would have changed things. But listen, no matter what Virginia did with their steals and the layups, uh, the coach Odom, he he never stopped attacking, and that's what it takes. Like the yeah. Eagles beating the other Patriots, they never stopped attacking. You can't sit on the lead. What they you, did, you've got to play. You've got to play like there's nothing to lose. You can't play to lose or to be careful. You have to attack, and you're absolutely right. Hey, they, they, you they put out a great them. shout out, and I agree with you to Steve Levy, the SID yeah. for UMBC guys that go really unnoticed, but who do an uh, unbelievable job. And yeah. you know what else is great, Stan? How great is is after this win, and no matter what happens going forward, this this stands. This is the story of the tournament. After it's, this great. It's a remarkable story. It's one that I I never saw coming. Uh, you know, listen, kudos to Tim Hall out there, the AD, for hiring Ryan. I'm not sure how the connection came about, but what a hire that was. Uh, listen, I, I'm not taking this opportunity to bash uh, Mark Turgeon, but I don't think there's a better basketball coach in the state of Maryland than Ryan Odom. I think he's, I, I said it before this, but I think he's a wonderful coach. He's got a big, big future in front of them. I think, in fact, this is such an eye-opening win. It may be hard for them to keep them next year, but it could be a year away. But uh, the son Listen, of Dave it's Oden, time. former Wake Forest, South Carolina coach, just a wonderful story. It's you time know. that somehow UMBC is going to have to open up their pockets to keep them. Uh, I, don't know how, I don't know how you can. It's kind of like the Florida Atlantic thing uh, when, uh, you know, Andy Enfield had that, that run to the Sweet 16, uh, you just you can't tell. I mean, a team like Pitt right now, with what they're going through, they've got eight or nine players asking to transfer. You know, maybe maybe they take a real bold gamble and hire somebody like Orion Odom. They couldn't think. Listen, Kevin Stalling is a decent coach. But you can't do much worse than 0-17 in the uh, ACC. No, no, you can't. The, on any level, that's oh, losing every yeah. game in conference is a sure fire way. Bruce, I was, in, I, was in the, uh, I was in the mode of traveling yesterday. I'm down here in Sarasota. I haven't been out. You know, I'll be out at the stadium around 10, 30, 11 o'clock this morning. But uh, great news for the Ravens, too. Uh, they finally made a, uh, an acquisition that I think is a little bit of a needle mover. I think Michael Crabtree brings a lot of the same characteristics that Derek Mason brought, that Steve Smith brought, that Anquan Bolden brought, you know, a real toughness, a real leadership. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, Lynn, I'm sorry the way it worked out with Ryan Grant. I really don't think the Ravens uh, intentionally failed a physical on that kid. You, you'd lose so much face with uh, agents that one player can't make that huge a difference. But I think the net result is the Ravens got the man that they needed to help their football team. I think that in the future, you know, uh, the Players Association might insist on physicals before signing. Right? Yeah, I, I would agree. And I, I think that, agree. I look, I don't believe the Ravens did it either, but... Boy, oh boy, it, I mean, Michael Crabtree sure, becomes available, it, and all of a sudden this guy fails the physical. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it was pretty amazing. What was, what was interesting about my trailing this story is when I, when I heard that they had signed him, uh, Grant, I wasn't real excited about it. Glenn Clark wasn't excited at all about the two moves. I, I think Brown is okay. 
but we were like scratching our heads over the grant move. And then I heard later that afternoon that they had restructured Brandon Williams to, to gain another $5 million in the cap. Uh, so I said, they must have something else coming. So, um, you know, according to the Ravens, they were still interested in Crabtree when he became available, even if they had signed Grant, you know, if that, if now, that signing had gone There's through. no way so, they would intentionally mislead. Yeah. They wouldn't do it. I mean, you're right. They, yeah. Their reputation would be tattered it's if too, it happened. It's too damaging. Yeah, you're absolutely Well, right. let's talk about Michael Crabtree. This guy, yeah. let me tell you, he's Anquan Bolden with speed. It's pretty yeah. well. It's pretty easy to say it. He's rough. He's tough. He he can go deep. He can go across the middle. Uh, yeah, he's he's a very versatile receiver, and he brings those. In, you know, I hate to say it, those intangibles that you need. And I think you know. Listen, I, I've pretty much. Uh, I think like all of Baltimore, we've all kind of given up on Brashard Perriman. But who knows? Maybe maybe somebody like that could take him under his wing, and and I you know I don't know. But Stan, having him in, in, in the receiver's room is certainly going to be a big plus. Stan, that ship has sailed. All right. Yeah, sure, yeah, it, sure that seems. That ship has so. sailed. I mean, I, I you know. That, I, that they an must, ugly, that's an ugly ship. Yeah, it just hasn't worked out. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's just time to move on. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping they'll stretch and get another receiver in the draft. And his name is DJ Moore. The best, uh, the boy, best I, hands I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. The but question we'll is, will he, will he be there at number at the Ravens number one? And I think he, I think he could be. Yeah, know? I think he and will I, be. All right, let's yeah, move on I, to the O's. That's what we were supposed to talk about. Yeah. Uh, give me. All right, let's do this. All right, give me the starting lineup opening day to the best of your opinion. Wow, the starting lineup or just the starting players that he's Stand up tougher than that. Give me the starting lineup. You know, nobody's holding you to it. All right. Well, it's really interesting. He, Buck Showalter really seems to be taking a look. You know, and again, I haven't been down here. I just got here. But it, it seems like this Mancini at leadoff is taking on a little something. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you at Mancini at leadoff, Machado at two, Scope at three, and uh, Chris Davis at four. Uh, Rasmus at five, maybe Beckham at six. Um, I think Valencia, prob- Valencia or Alvarez is seven. Who am I leaving out? I'm leaving somebody out. I'm leaving. Uh, I'm Come leaving on, Sam Tank. The home I'm run hitter. A- the home run hitter. What's that? Trump. Tra- begins, begins with a T. So, the home run hitter, the DH, possibly. Yeah, who who are you saying I'm leaving out? I said Alvarez because I'm assuming they're going to face a right-hander in the first game. So I'm thinking that Alvarez is the DH, Davis is at first, Scope, Machado, Beckham. I don't think that I mentioned Beckham. Beckham probably bats eighth. And How's Joseph Beckham been at third, by the way? I have not seen enough of them to say. Everybody from, you know, I've, I've seen snippets of games. Uh, I was more interested in seeing Kashner. Uh, that's very promising that he's thrown two positive outings of the, uh, four innings each. Uh, and, and I tell you, the uh, revelation seems to be uh, because he, he's proven it over long enough periods of seasons that you know that he has top-level stuff is uh, Mr. Gosman. You know, the fact that he's uh, pitching at this level right now might show a, a very highly motivated person. I really pray, though, that they do not give him the opening day assignment, no matter how good he is. I think Dylan Bundy should get that. I think Gosman should be two or even three. Maybe Kashner starts two and, and keep the pressure off of Gosman early, and I think you'll get more out of him. Tillman make the but, rotation uh, again. Knowing this number five starter, uh, it's just a it's a, it's a shame they they don't seem to have the interest or the wherewithal to uh, to go the extra mile right now and get Alex Cobb. I think Cobb's going to end up either with the Phillies or with the Dodgers. Trumbo's uh, situation. 
The Trumbo situation, listen, I never root for anybody to get hurt, but I think given where the Orioles are right now uh, and what he was last year and the way he looked this spring, I don't think this is a negative at all. I think it's a. Um, I think it gives them the ability to look more closely at Santander. Uh, and by the way, that's the guy I may have left out. He could possibly win the DH role uh, for the early season, at least against right-handed pitching, with Valencia uh, doing it against um, left-handed pitching. So we'll see. Uh, but th- listen. The signings of Valencia and Rasmus, the potential that Santander is exhibiting, are all very big positives. I think we're pretty all agreement uh, on agreement that Scope and Machado will have huge years. I think Mancini will do about what he did last year as he really gets his feet solidly on the ground as a major league player. Uh, and I think Adam Jones will have a good year. I think you're going to see Adam Jones this year be much more of 142 rather than 160 uh, games. Yeah, you left fighter. Adam Jones out of the lineup. Did I, I, I didn't have him in the no. – I left him out of the lineup. Yeah. So I think he's going to bat – I think he's going to bat fifth. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So it's Mancini, Machado, Scope, Davis, Jones, then the DH, probably Santander against a right-hander on opening day, or, or Alvarez – and then Rasmus, um, Beckham, and Joseph. You know, that's, it might surprise you. Day. or Maybe you hear about I heard oil ticket sales are great. I, I certainly hope that's the case. You know, they've, um, you know, there, there's been a variety of things at play there. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that John Angelos has taken a more firm hand in, in running the show, uh, what that's about. I'll let the Orioles um, weigh in on it at a certain point in time, but it's very clear that they've got a new set of eyeballs. But I haven't seen any evidence of of marketing that would make me think that there's a great demand for tickets. I think that John's idea of the kids free the kids cheer free zone is an exceptional idea. It's it's one that is unique, and the Orioles are never really at the top of the list of unique when it comes to marketing. And that's not a knock at their marketing people. It's sort of a, they are a old family, family run organization, you know, and um, a lot of times Mr. A uh, is set in his ways. And it's, it's very easy for us when we're in our forties or fifties to say that somebody should be much more progressive about certain, certain things uh, when you're sitting in, in your 80s, it's hard to be. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. But uh, to me, when as as a season ticket holder like you are, and I look at yeah. they they've just you know prices have basically remained the same. They also yeah. their exchange policy is fantastic. They've improved yeah. that. Uh, yeah. There's and then the thing with the kids free is fantastic. It's smart. You, you're giving yeah. away empty seats is what you're doing uh, yeah. for concessions and to get the parents at the game. There's so you know many- what it reminds me of, Bruce. It reminds me of about 14 years ago when things were just absolutely horrible. I'm not sure who came up with the idea, but they started giving away those six or seven T-shirts each year, and they were all orange. And suddenly, when the stadium was full, you'd see people wearing these orange T-shirts. And I think what they're doing now is they're planting seeds with the young kids. They're trying, and I think Major League Baseball really needs to take a, uh, you know, a, a page from this. And that's where the future of the game is. You've got to grow the number of kids that are going to come out to baseball games. And the other reason is the Yankees come in nine times with Giancarlo Stanton. Stan? Yeah. He's going to take some, over the American League. That's going to be some. That's going to be some team the Yankees have. I'll they sure. You, they really do. They sure. I, I, sure will be. I think the. I think the best three teams in all of baseball are in the American League, and uh, I'm talking about the Astros, the Indians, and the Yankees. Uh, it's a. It's a fearsome trio of teams, and uh, I'd be very surprised if the National League wins a World Series this year. Well, that's an e- early prediction, I'll remember. But uh, Stan, uh, because of UMBC, we got to do this again and talk to Orioles a lot deeper. Uh, we'll have yeah. you. Maybe when you get back, we'll have you on again. Okay, partner? All 
tomorrow and maybe in two weeks. You got All it. Right? All right. This is Bruce Posner. Take care. This is Bruce Posner. You are listening to Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven or today, Retriever Talk. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. This Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Hear the first and second rounds of the men's college basketball tournament games live on the radio. Thursday and Friday, hear first round tournament games at noon and 3. Then on Saturday and Sunday, hear second round tournament games at noon and 2.30. And beginning March 24th, we'll have all the games right up to the championship on April 2nd. The college basketball championships are on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, the Sports Maven. Back here on segment two, and uh, everything kind of changed today because of the UMBC win. Just one of the all-time stories. But we do have uh, eight games today to talk about in March Madness. And, of course, on the phone right now is my often co-host, good friend, videographer, Wayne Viner. Wayne, welcome in today. Good morning, Bruce. Did you like, Boy, the, na- tw- did you like the name of the show today, Retriever Talk? <laughs> I, I think that's appropriate. I think there are many stations across the country today running Retriever Talk. It is. You know, it's funny. You and me sat there and watched... I think it was 24 to 18, UMBC was beating Maryland at halftime. And this guy, K.J. Mora, we both agreed, was one of the most fun guys ever to watch. And somehow or another, uh, Odom has developed him and Jairus Lyles, who was 6 for 20 against uh, the Terps when they played him, into like... Like a machine almost yesterday. Can it continue? I don't know. I don't know if you can keep up. Can a guy shoot nine for 11 again like Lyles did? I don't know. Well, I think that history has been littered with teams that ran through a tournament and stayed hot. If you look at what UMBC did, they had a horrible losing streak against Vermont, who they played in the championship and they beat them, you, you got Virginia. <clears throat> Clearly, that wasn't a great basketball game. It wasn't, a, as you said before, it wasn't a nail-biter. It didn't go down the last second. The reason the game was memorable is that UMBC blew them out. Yeah, to me, so, that's what makes you, it the greatest upset in the history of uh, college basketball. Not so much that they won. It wasn't like a half-court shot that they won on. It was the number 16 seed, seed absolutely demolishing for UVA. And again, once again, Tony Bennett can't get it done in the postseason, which is hard to imagine because he's such a great coach and they had such a great year, but it's all forgotten. It's all forgotten. Well, actually, this one's going to be remembered for all the wrong reasons. For them. This is the first time this has ever happened. I went to the first time with a 15 15- beat a two, and that was in Cole Fieldhouse in 1991. Uh, Richmond with Dick Tarrant, the legendary Richmond coach, beat Syracuse there. And that had never happened. But this, what, what was it, 133-0, and 0, six teams over the one? That's a pretty good winning streak. Yeah, there's been some close ones, though. There's been some overtimes. You had that Princeton game against Georgetown, but this was not a game. This was a laugher at the end. This was like... And, and look, he, Tony, I mean, uh, Odom proved one thing. You always stay on the attack. And he did it. He never let up. He never took the foot off the gas. Even when Virginia made a couple really minor runs, I don't think they ever got it below 10. They just stormed back. And Mora and Lyles and even the rest of the team uh what do you say? I mean, I'm still in shock. It's gonna, you know, it's gonna stay with you for a long, long time. And what I feel great about Wayne is that, you know, I we know we have experience winning, although not lately, except for lacrosse. But those wins, those that championship win in 2002, uh, 
you know, some of the women's wins in lacrosse, although it's on a different scale, and certainly men's lacrosse last year, those wins stay with you. And this game will stay with UMBC forever. And now they have a new gym to celebrate in, Wayne. I mean, to That's me, it's such, a, it's such a great story that uh, I'm just ecstatic for UMBC. And I often talk about how great uh, local college basketball is, and you wonder why the arenas aren't filled up. Maybe this is the, the kicker, you know, with Towson and Loyola and Coppin State and Morgan and UMBC, Baltimore – I think the game really put Baltimore basketball a little bit uh, more on the map. The fact that UMBC could just totally take apart arguably the best team in the country. I understand 40% or 38% of the brackets had UVA going all the way. Yeah, as far as a gambling uh, take on this, I was reading last night that if you had bet, I think the minimum bet was 500 on this. If you bet UMBC you only won twenty five thousand. I think that was the ratio. Yeah, fifty. But I don't know who would have taken that bet. Yeah, hundred to one. I don't know. Nobody. We even. You know. No. I guarantee you that bet wasn't made much. But uh, all right, let's move on. Uh, the Lady Terps cruised over Princeton. I'm going to talk about that with Todd in the next section. Uh, we'll face NC State tomorrow. Ravens signed Matt, Michael Crabtree and. Uh, uh, Grant did not. Ryan Grant did not pass the physical, but we have eight games today, Wayne. And let's start them off. And well, I tell you what, six of them are almost flips in my eyes. You got uh, Villanova and Alabama. Look, Alabama can shock you. They can shock you, but still, Nova's an eleven-point favorite on that. I can't see them losing that game today. They're just a really good team who can play both slower and faster basketball. So I think Villanova scales up and down as well as anybody they have. It's just whether or not having a, you know, without big presence in the middle for Villanova, whether that's going to come back to bite them or not. But they are a legitimate tournament-tested team. I think they're going to take Alabama today. And Phil Booth is back. I don't think that's not a big factor. He missed a few games. They struggled everyone. Phil Booth is back. And, you know, Jalen Brunson is the straw. But if you remember in the tournament, it was Phil Booth's play that took them to the promised land. So, uh, you know, Phil Booth out of uh, St. Joe's, just a great kid, great player. Now Maryland's lucky to get the St. Joe kids. Uh, the Buffalo getting five and a half against Kentucky. That's all. Could the What is Buffalo now? Is it the Bison or is it the, the Bulls? The Bulls. The Bulls, yeah. right. So we saw Buffalo play West Virginia a couple of years ago in the NCAA tournament, and that's when Hurley was the coach there. Right. And they gave West Virginia everything they could handle. Of course, West Virginia won that game and then went on to beat Maryland the next night. Um, Kentucky caught fire at the right time. They have played fantastic basketball. Calipari, once again, has figured this out. Now I'm looking for Kentucky to actually make a run of this. So I'm clearly on the Kentucky side of the ledger today. Uh, I think so, but I tell you what, I wouldn't lay five and a half points. I think Buffalo's going to give them a battle. All right? I can't swear to it, but, uh, you know, how about the Dukies in uh, Rhode Island? Rhode Island's a very interesting team. I thought they looked great the other day. Dukies are nine and a half point favorites, but it seems like they got all their cylinders, or although they were a little lackadaisical in that game, but it was such a mismatch. But it seems like they got their mojo going right now. Yeah, I see a lot of brackets, and I've read things of having Duke as an alternate pick to win the championship. This is a team that I think I'm going to use now the reverse logic of the Kentucky game. I think with all those freshmen. And they're all heading on this, you know, every game you play now, it could be the last game you were playing in college, where Rhode Island's a battle-tested team. If anybody has any knowledge, I think, of how to beat a, a Dukey team, it's going to be a guy with a last name of Hurley. And I'm going seven over the two, Rhode Island over Duke for the upset today. Uh, another great, it's such great games today, Wayne. Houston and Michigan. 
Houston, the Michigan's game the other day was it was one of the worst basketball games I've ever watched. I mean, it was almost as bad as Michigan State yesterday against Big Bucknell that turned into a slugfest. But I'm sticking with Michigan, and now that UVA's out of it, uh, I'm seeing Michigan getting to the final game, the championship game against West Virginia. And I'm staying with West Virginia. I thought that uh, yesterday, how great was Javon Carter? He was just unbelievable, Wayne. How old is he, Bruce? I don't know. Well, looks, he's 40. He looks older, but he's, yeah, I'm sure he's 22, whatever, whatever. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he, he just looks older. But can he play? He plays every facet of the game. He's a great defender. He's a great scorer. He's a great driver. He's a great passer. There's not much he doesn't have. I love that guy. Well, I think that we, we can't go much further on that one. But what do you have with Florida and Texas Tech? Well, Florida surprised me the other day. They're getting two points against Texas Tech. I'm going to stay in the state of Texas. I'm not sold on Florida. Uh, mm. I just, uh, you know, it's not a game, I won't kid you, where I know much about either team. So it's hard for me to uh, think about. But uh, I just think the Texas Tech's resume that, uh, although the SEC is unbeaten so far. It's almost dead. So you know who else is unbeaten? The Big Ten. The Big Ten is unbeaten so far. Now, the injury to Isaac Haas was one of the saddest things I could see uh, breaking his elbow in the dance after all that he's put forward for for Purdue. I don't know how they recover from that way. Although the backup isn't I, bad. Their backup I don't think that bad. they do. I don't think I, – I put them almost as though they lost the game because they lost Isaac Haas. But you have to remember that the, the player of the year in the Big Ten – still on that team. They have a really good point guard. They still have uh, outside shooting that is really world-class outside shooting there. All right, so look, maybe Haas didn't score that much for them, but he did dominate the game when he was in there. Uh, Loyola Chicago. Five points against Tennessee. I don't know if they watched that game the other day. I thought Loyola Chicago, I, I, I would love them against Tennessee today. I think that everybody picked them. They were no surprise to win. But uh, I, I, happened, I would happen to go with them today without question. And how about right, this well, one? No. How about this one, Wayne? Kansas, only four and a half favor over Seton Hall. I would like Seton Hall all year. The resurgence of these smaller Big East schools I think is really cool when I was – uh, growing up and in college, Seton Hall had P.J. Carlissimo, and they went all the way to the national championship. So it's great to see them back. I'm sorry to see Providence lose yesterday, but, geez, Kansas, once again, this is an inside-outside team. They can beat you either way. Uh, Graham at guard is off the charts. I think Kansas is going to go a long way on this tournament. Yeah, right now it looks that way. And then the game, that one I think the most interesting game of the day besides Houston and Michigan, and of course we follow these teams, is Ohio State and Gonzaga. I mean, Ohio State's getting three against Gonzaga, who looked uh, very shaky the other day. Uh, you know, down in the last minute, pulled it out. Can the Buckeyes and Mr. bates Diop pull it off today? Yeah, I think the guy that's making that team go is Dakich. I have been so shocked by how well he's played and how many minutes he gets. And then, you know, you got your Baltimore guy, Cam Williams, who was starting to light it up there. So I don't have a lot of faith in Ohio State, and right now Gonzaga is a tournament brand name. I know they're only a four seed, but I'm going to go Big Ten basically because I've underrated Ohio State all year, and I really thought Gonzaga and St. Mary's that didn't even make the tournament were higher ranked. So I guess they're not. And Gonzaga not the greatest team this year. I'm torn, Bruce. I'm, I'm going to go to Ohio I'm State Buc just because they're in the Big Ten. I'm Buckeye bound today for sure. Wayne, we are out of time. We'll see you later on. Um, uh Big game for the Terps today at, at Villanova, a bounce-back game. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see what they're made of today, okay? Because that's a game that you and me kind of had penciled as a question mark this year. So we'll see how they go. But uh, that's going to do it for today. Thanks a lot for coming on, Wayne.
Hey, thanks for having me. Go Terps and go Retrievers. Go Retrievers is right. All right, no one ever asked. This is the Sports Maven Show, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. All right, welcome back to segment three of Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. And, of course, this segment is brought to you by Coons Ford on Security Boulevard and my good buddy Dennis Kalatis. Inventory is just incredible there. The deals are there. Best service department in the state. Uh, I buy all my cars there. My friends, so many of my friends have gone there, always satisfied at Coons Ford on Security Boulevard. Ask for Dennis or Christos Galatis, tell them I sent you, and uh, you'll get a great deal. But if you don't ask for them, you'll get a great deal from anybody there because they don't turn barely anything down. On the phone right now is one of probably the most gung ho retriever guy I know who's also a, a Terp fan, uh, probably because, you know, retrievers haven't had the tremendous success. But all that changed last night. Did did it not, Todd Carton? It certainly did, Bruce. And uh, Good morning to you. I'm a little, still a little bleary because I couldn't get to sleep last night. I was so excited. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing. We talk about it all the time. We do our shows. We do our reports. And because you, the, the end result is you live with the wins. If you... Sports are great, and following your teams are so great because there are those occasions when you get the big wins, like Maryland winning lacrosse last year, uh, going back to the national championship, getting to the Final Four. You remember those days, but no one will ever forget almost where they were when UMBC pulled off the greatest upset in college basketball history. And, and you know, Bruce, it, it left me speechless. Um, That's impossible. I, I, That's impossible. <laughs> the, the world turned upside down, Bruce. What can I say? It, it, it really did. My phone was blowing up. I was getting texts and tweets, and it, it got to the point where, where I actually had to turn off the notification tone on my phone because people were, were equally excited for me, and you know I, I can barely contain myself even this morning. Well, Todd, if you don't know, it's been a, a – great patron for UMBC. Uh, we won't go into what he's done, but certainly things to be proud of. And he was so nice to invite me and Wayne and Mason for the opening of the UMBC arena. And what are the, re- it's such a, it's such a symbiotic situation that here they are, they pull off the biggest win, the biggest upset and the biggest win in their history. And now they have a new arena to go to. The place yeah. will be rocking next year. It will be rocking without question. And, you know, now they got to do, and Todd will be coming to you for some help, I bet, to try and keep <laughs> Mr. Odom. All right. <laughs> you know, they I, should they, call you. They should call you today. All right. <laughs> you know, I, 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 they, they may, Bruce. They may. Can they come up with the kind of money they would need to keep him? You, you know, I. I I would think that that they'll certainly work at it. Someone someone put a comment up that uh, you Virginia spent six million more than six million dollars on its men's basketball team this past year or last year, and UMBC spent about four million dollars on all of its men's athletics. Yeah, well, look, there's no way to figure it out, but you have magic hit the road. And Todd, one thing you know, one thing you know, I said is. If we were going to go to the NIT, the one team I did not want to play was who? UMBC. Right, because the way they play, you know, and you know, they might have made Maryland go to UMBC, and that would have been uh, an all-time nightmare this year. But, man, oh, man, I'm so happy for them. I'm so happy for the SID, Steve Levy, a great guy, and the athletic director, and the whole program, great fans. I, I know that they've had some tremendous success in soccer over the years. Actually, have been Maryland's, I would say, Maryland's chief rival in soccer. And the games are incredible. The game this year was great. But yeah. this, this is a different level. This is the whole country, not, not just here in Baltimore. And wow, yeah, what, the, what they've UNBC's done. UNBC's website crashed last night because of the traffic. Yeah, it's, listen. 
the whole country is in awe. There's no question about it. The whole country is in awe over this win. And KJ Moore, one of the most one of the most fun players I ever watched. We commented on that when he was there. And and Todd, I have a new thing now in these big games for the Terps and I'm back. I think the key thing is for you not to go. All right. <laughs> Seriously. Because you don't go to this game, which I thought was impossible, all right, and and they win. You yeah. didn't go to the NCAA lacrosse tournament last year, and people, you have to understand, Todd goes everywhere. He goes everywhere. And for whatever he was in Europe or something, didn't go to that, and he said to me, it's a guarantee they'll win. But listen, it goes on, and uh, this one lives in lore of basketball. It'll always be talked about the first time <clears throat> a 16 beat a 1, but it was the way they beat them, was the way they took them apart, Todd, that just, was really amazing. Just to, re- really, and, and, you know, I think it, it, it boils down to Virginia never looked up at a deficit like that, and they didn't know how to handle it all year. Yeah, kind of like when a wishbone team get falls behind in football. All right, Todd, we got to move on. Maryland basketball tomorrow. Great win for the Terps yesterday. Uh, I thought Ileana uh, Christianaki was fantastic. They play NC State tomorrow. Uh, how do you rate? Is that game like a pick'em game, or would Maryland be a little bit favored or not? Well, I think that that NC State is probably slightly favored because of their home court. But I think certainly on a neutral court or in College Park, it would be Maryland's game. Um, Maryland, Maryland looked really terrific and, and locked in defensively yesterday again. And as you recall, when, when they were sort of ripping off those seven straight wins after the loss to Michigan State, uh, I kept talking about how well they were playing defensively. And I think they just kind of ran out of steam a little bit at the end of the year and um, end of the year kind of just running on fumes. And maybe this week, week and a half off has really helped them. Uh, I, I think that, that Maryland has a, certainly has a top-level chance to win this game. The, the common opponents that the two teams have, Maryland has wins over all of the teams or that they, they both played uh, and NC State lost to them. That would be Rutgers, Virginia, and Miami. Well, that's you know that means something, but at this point of the year, not much. And being at NC State, I don't know, it could work in Maryland's favor. Real quick, Todd, I want to say Todd just posted a great story about UMBC on TerpTalk.com. Wayne got it up there right away, so go to it and take a look. And Todd, uh, the men's lacrosse team, just a, a huge, huge game today at Villanova. I believe they'll bounce back. I really do. Uh, tough loss last week. You agree or not? Well, I, I agree. You know, it, it, if you lose by one goal in overtime to you know the number one team in the country, it's not a big deal. We just have to see how they handle being on the road. Hopefully, the the experience at High Point, where they struggled a little bit, will they'll take that to heart. Uh, Virgin, Villanova is a, a fabulous team. Yeah, it would not be a major upset. It would not be a upset of UMBC proportions. That's the new barometer of upsets, uh, Todd. There's no doubt about it. Every upset. Oh, yeah, that was an upset, but it doesn't match UMBC because they they pulled off the biggest upset in the history, in my eyes, of college basketball, bigger than Chaminade beating Virginia because it was uh, basically a meaningless game, Uh, bigger than Appalachian State beating Michigan in football. I'm I'm labeling it one of the biggest upsets ever, and uh, hats off to the Retrievers. And Todd... Hey, let's. It's time for the retrievers to get greedy, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And remember, when when they take the court Sunday night, uh, a sixteen team, sixteen seeded team has never lost in the round of thirty two in the men's tournament. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Unbeaten. All right, that's going to do it for us today, Todd. Thanks for coming on. See thanks, you. Bruce. See you Wednesday on Terp Talk here on CBS Sports Radio.